Section 1 of The Destination of Man by Johann Gottlieb Fichte, translated by Jane Sinnott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1. Doubt. The Aim of My Being. At last, then, I may hope that I am tolerably well acquainted with the world that surrounds me. In the unanimous declaration of my senses, in unfailing experience alone have I placed my trust. What I have beheld, I have touched. What I have touched, I have analyzed. I have repeated my observations again and again. I have compared the various phenomena together, and only when I could perceive their connection, when I could explain and deduce one from the other, and foresee the result, and that the result was such as to justify my calculations, have I been satisfied. Therefore am I now as well assured of the accuracy of this part of my knowledge as of my own existence. I walk with a firm step in this my world, and would stake welfare and life itself on the infallibility of my convictions. But what then am I, and what is the aim and end of my being? The question is superfluous. It is long since I have been made well acquainted with these points, and it would take much time to recapitulate all that I have heard, learnt, and believed concerning them and by what means then have i attained this knowledge which i have this confused notion of possessing have i urged on by a burning desire of knowledge toiled on through uncertainty and doubt and contradiction have i when anything appeared credible examined and sifted and compared till an inward voice proclaimed irresistibly and without a possibility of mistake? Thus it is, as surely as thou livest. No, I can remember no such state of mind. Those instructions were bestowed on me before I desired them. The answers were given before the questions were proposed. I heard, for I could not avoid doing so, and much of what I heard remained in my memory, but without examination and without interest i allowed everything to take its place as chance directed how then could i persuade myself that if i really possessed any knowledge upon these points if i can only be said to know that of which i am convinced and which i have wrought out myself experienced i cannot truly say that i know anything at all of the aim and end of my being I know merely what others profess to know, and all that I can really be assured of is that I have heard them speak so and so upon these things. Whilst then I have inquired into and examined for myself with the most anxious care comparatively trivial matters, in things of the highest import I have relied wholly on the care and fidelity of others. I have attributed to others an interest in the highest affairs of humanity, an earnestness and accuracy, which I by no means discover in myself. I have regarded them as indescribably superior to me. Whatever of truth they really possess, they can have attained by no other means than by their own meditations and why may not i by the same means attain the same ends how much have i undervalued and degraded myself it shall be no longer thus from this moment i will enter on my rights on the dignity to which i have a claim let all that is foreign to my own mind be at once renounced i will examine for myself it may be that secret wishes concerning the termination of my inquiries that a partial inclination towards certain conclusions will awaken in my heart i will forget and deny these wishes 
and allow them no influence in the direction of my thoughts i will go to work with scrupulous severity what i find to be truth shall be welcome to me let it sound as it may i will know with the same certainty with which i can calculate that this ground will bear me when i tread on it that this fire will burn me if i approach too near it will i know what i am and what i shall be and should this not be possible thus much at least will i know that it is not possible even to this result will i submit if it should present itself to me as truth i hasten towards the fulfilment of my task i seize on nature as she hastens ever onward in her flight detain her for an instant and contemplate steadily the present moment this nature on which my thinking powers have been developed and for which the conclusions valid in her domain have been formed i am surrounded by objects which i am compelled to regard as wholes subsisting for themselves and separately from each other i behold plants trees and animals i ascribe to each individual certain signs and attributes by which i distinguish it from others to this plant such a form to another another to this tree such and such leaves to another others differing from them every object has its appointed number of attributes neither more nor less to every question whether it is this or that is for any one acquainted with it a decisive yes or no possible everything that is is something or it is not has a certain color or has it not is tangible or is not and so on every object possesses its properties in an appointed degree which it neither exceeds nor falls short of everything that is is definite determined is some one thing and is not something else not that i am unable to conceive an object hovering between opposite limitations i am certainly able to do this for half of my thoughts consist of such i think of a tree in general has this tree leaves or not fruit or not and if so in what quantities to what species does it belong how large is it all these questions must remain unanswered for my thought is undetermined and does not represent any particular tree but a tree in general and it has no real existence for whatever really exists has its appointed number of all its possible attributes and each of these in its appointed measure although i may never be able to comprehend all the properties of any one object or to apply to them any standard nature however hastens on through her everlasting transformations and while i am speaking of the present moment it is gone and all is changed in the same manner the moment before my observation all was otherwise it had not always been as i found it it had become so why then and from what cause had it become what it was why had nature amidst the manifold infinite possible varieties of being assumed precisely these and no others for this reason that certain others had preceded them and these in the same manner will determine those which shall follow and these again others to infinity were the smallest thing at the present moment different from what it is then necessarily in the following moment would something else be different and again in the succeeding one and so on for ever nature in her never ceasing changes follows steadily certain undeviating laws i find myself in a close chain of phenomena in which every link depends on that which has preceded it so that if at any moment i could be made acquainted with all existing conditions of the universe i should be able to declare what they had been in the preceding moment and what they would be in that which was to follow in every part i find the whole 
for every part only by means of the whole has become what it is what i have discovered then i find amounts to this that to every existence another must be presupposed to every condition another preceding condition let me pause a little here for it may happen that on my clear insight into this point may depend much of the success of my future inquiry why and from what cause i had asked are the modifications of objects precisely such as i find them to be assuming thus without a moment's hesitation and without proof as an absolute and certain truth that they had a cause that not by themselves but by something beyond them they had obtained existence and reality i had found myself compelled to assume another existence as a necessary condition of theirs but why then did i find their existence insufficient to itself incomplete what betrayed to me a want in them this without doubt that in the first place these qualities or attributes do not exist in and for themselves they are forms of something formed modifications of something modified and the conception of what in the language of the schools has been called a substratum a something capable of receiving and supporting the attributes must be always added to them further that to such a substratum a certain quality is attributed supposes a condition of repose and cessation from change otherwise there could be no determinate modification but merely a passing from one state to another a state of mere passivity is an incomplete existence some activity is necessary to form what may be called the basis of the suffering what i found myself compelled to suppose was by no means that in the successive changes which nature undergoes one brings forth the other that the present modification annihilates itself and in the next moment when it no longer exists produces another to occupy its place the modification produces neither itself nor anything out of itself what i found myself compelled to assume was an active force peculiar to the object to account for the gradual origin and the changes of those modifications and what then do i conceive to be the nature or essence of this power and the modes of its manifestation i know no more than this that it is capable under certain conditions of producing certainly and infallibly a determinative effect and no other the principle of activity of arising and becoming is certainly in itself as surely as it is a force it is capable of setting itself in motion the cause of its having developed itself in a certain manner lies partly in itself as it is a force and partly in the circumstances under which it develops itself both these the inward determination of a force from itself and the external by circumstances must be united to produce a given change every force so far as i can conceive of one must be determinate but its determination is completed by the circumstances under which it is developed a force exists in my conception only so far as i can perceive its working an inactive force is entirely inconceivable i see a flower that has sprung out of the earth and i conclude that a formative power exists in nature such a formative power exists for me only so far as this flower and others and plants and animals exist i can describe this power merely by its effect and it exists for me no further than as producing flowers and plants animals and other organic forms i will go further and maintain that a flower and precisely this flower could exist in this place only so far as all circumstances united to make it possible 
but that by the union of all these circumstances for its possibility the real existence of the flower is by no means explained to me and for this i am compelled to assume a peculiar original power in nature and precisely a flower producing power for another power of nature under the same circumstances might have produced something entirely different when i contemplate all things as one whole i perceive one nature one force when i regard them as individuals many forces which develop themselves according to their inward laws and pass through all the forms of which they are capable and all the objects in nature are but these forces under certain limitations every manifestation of every individual power of nature is determined partly by itself partly by its own preceding manifestations and partly by the manifestations of all the other powers of nature with which it is connected but it is connected with all for nature is one connected whole its manifestations are therefore strictly necessary and it is absolutely impossible that it should be other than what it is in every moment of her duration nature is one connected whole in every moment must every individual part be what it is because all others are what they are and a single grain of sand could not be moved from its place without however imperceptibly to us changing something throughout all parts of the immeasurable whole every moment of duration is determined by all past moments and will determine all future moments and even the position of a grain of sand cannot be conceived other than it is without supposing other changes to an indefinite extent let us imagine for instance this grain of sand lying some few feet further inland than it actually does then must the storm wind that drove it in from the seashore have been stronger than it actually was then must the preceding state of the atmosphere by which this wind was occasioned and its degree of strength determined have been different from what it actually was and the previous changes which gave rise to this particular weather and so on we must suppose a different temperature from that which really existed a different constitution of the bodies which influenced this temperature the fertility or barrenness of countries the duration of the life of man depend unquestionably in a great degree upon temperature how can we know since it is not given us to penetrate the arcana of nature and it is therefore allowable to speak of possibilities how can we know that in such a state of the weather as we have been supposing in order to carry this grain of sand a few yards further some ancestor of yours might not have perished from hunger or cold or heat long before the birth of that son from whom you are descended and thus you might never have been at all and all that you have ever done and all that you ever hope to do in this world must have been hindered in order that a grain of sand might lie in a different place end of section one